Hi, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the 2021 Darwin Lecture. I want to thank the Department of Biology and the Dean of Sciences for helping us put this together. Um, this talk was scheduled for uh, a year ago, uh, for, for Mar late March 2020. And of course, as you know, uh, many things were delayed, and this has been postponed for a year. Uh, but I think it's kind of fitting that it's been the really the most Darwinian year uh, for most of us in our lives. We, we got to sit by and watch a, a rapidly evolving bit of RNA change our routines and change uh, our whole lives, really. And it's put phylogenies and SIR models and convergent evolution on the front page of the newspapers. So it's, it's been a year that taught us all that evolution, uh, evolutionary thinking is really important. And when things are important, it's important that we have thinkers who are willing to question the kind of core assumptions, the foundational assumptions underlying the discipline to make sure that we get it right. And here at NYU, we have a kind of informal evolutionary biology book club that about two years ago read uh, Joan Roughgarden's book, The Genial Gene. And uh, in reading that book, we heard a voice that was very clearly unafraid to question the foundational assumptions of the field. And it's a voice that was persuasive to us in, in teaching us that we had been uh, thinking about a lot of things in kind of sloppy ways and that kind of more rigorous approach to foundational assumptions was really important. And it's a voice that I'm delighted that you will get to hear from today. Um, so Professor Joan Roughgarden is one of our most accomplished figures in evolution and ecology, um, particularly having made enormous contributions to a huge range of theoretical topics in those disciplines. Um, among her books is Evolution's Rainbow, Diversity, Gender, and Sexuality in Nature and People. And that's a book that won the American Library Association Stonewall Award uh, a few years ago. If uh, not for COVID, we'd be meeting in person. And I'd say that after the, the talk, we should go have a drink at the Stonewall. And in this uh, occasion, we're, we're stuck in our rooms wherever we may be. Um, but the good news is that we're gonna get to hear a really exciting lecture about the gender binary in nature across human cultures and in the Bible. So um, Joan is gonna take questions at the end. I hope you'll stick around for a little discussion. Uh, and in the meantime, please join me in welcoming Joan Roughgarden. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a lovely introduction and I hope I can take a rain check on visiting this Stonewall uh, Cafe. I'd, I'd just love to visit it and I never have. Any case, um, I thank uh, Matt, uh, Michelle Duvall, members of the biology department and all the faculty and staff who have invited me to join you in offering the 2021 Darwin lecture to your department. I'm honored and overjoyed to be here with you. I appreciate your willingness to continue your tradition of an annual Darwin lecture via Zoom in these difficult times. In this talk, I wish to show you by direct inspection that the belief in a male-female gender binary we have grown up with is no more than a quaint myth of historical interest. For the first half of my talk, I will review zoological diversity in gender and sexuality, and in the second half, the comparative anthropology of gender. So to begin, what is the purpose of sex? Many people say the purpose of sex is to reproduce. Well, this answer is not correct. Many species reproduce without sex. The slide shows geckos from South Pacific islands who reproduce asexually. Many other species do too, including whiptail lizards from the American Southwest. Because their eggs do not need fertilization, these species consist solely of females. Thus, reproduction is perfectly possible without sex. And the purpose of sex is to provide the offspring with a mixture of genes from two parents. Gene mixing is the purpose of sex, not reproduction. Next, what defines a male and a female? Most people define male and female on the basis of behavior, appearance, and or sex chromosomes. However, such traits do not define 
male and female for biologists, because these traits vary too much among individuals within and across species. To define male and female in a way that applies to all living things, from seaweed to sea lions, biologists define a male as an individual who solely produces sperm throughout his life. A female is an individual who solely produces eggs throughout her life. And a hermaphrodite as an individual who produces both sperm and eggs at some point throughout their life. The next question is, what defines a sperm and an egg? By definition, a sperm is the smaller gamete and the egg is the larger gamete. Other distinguishing characteristics of gametes, such as the tail on a sperm, and the coating covering an egg are incidental to the definition. Are there only two sizes of gametes? Yes, this is the only genuine binary that exists. <clears throat> the individuals in almost all sexually reproducing species produce solely two sizes of gametes, one big and one small. There are almost no species whose individuals produce three sizes of functioning gametes, small, medium, and large, or that produce sizes varying continuously from small to large. Moreover, if the individuals of a species produce gametes of only one size, such as some fungi, then male and female are not defined for that species. So practically speaking, the sole universal sex binary in biology is the dichotomy between egg and sperm. <clears throat> there is no universal sex binary among the whole organisms themselves, only among their gametes. The difference in size between the egg and the sperm is usually huge. The slide illustrates the size difference between a human egg and sperm. Well, who are the hermaphrodites? A simultaneous hermaphrodite is an individual who produces both sperm and eggs at the same time. A sequential hermaphrodite produces eggs and sperm at different times. Sequential hermaphrodites come in two varieties, male first, then female, and female first, then male. Sequential hermaphrodites change sex during life. That means, by definition, they transition from making sperm to making eggs or vice versa. Accompanying a change in the size of the gametes produced, a sequential hermaphrodite also changes in incidental characteristics, such as sex specific body colors, shapes and behaviors. Now, most plants are hermaphrodites. About Only about 6% of plant species have separate sexes. Many marine invertebrate and vertebrate and vertebrate groups are hermaphroditic. The slide illustrates three hermaphroditic coral reef species. On the left are blue-headed wrasses, a species with some individuals who change from female to male. In the middle are clownfish, a species with some individuals who change from male to female. And on the right are hamlets, a species with individuals who are simultaneously male and female. Hamlets do not self-fertilize. The figure depicts a mating dance wherein one species releases eggs and the other releases sperm. Then they turn over and reverse roles. Across both marine and terrestrial environments, about 6% of all animal species are hermaphroditic. However, if the insects are not counted, the percentage rises to 33% of animal species that are hermaphroditic. Now, what are the proper sex roles, so to speak? Focusing now on the non-hermaphroditic species, discourse about sex roles usually envisions males as fertilizing many females with a limitless supply of tiny sperm while females are limited to producing a small number of large eggs. Hence, females are supposed to be choosy about their mates 
lest they waste their expensive eggs on ugly weaklings, while males wantonly pursue easy conquests. This popular narrative of, quote, the passionate male and, quote, the coy female, to quote Darwin's unfortunate phrases, is directly contradicted by species in which the proper roles are reversed. In fish, parental care of eggs is usually provided by males. On the bottom is a pipefish from a group of fish whose long tubular bodies resemble a flute. In pipefish, the males glue the fertilized eggs to their bellies while they swim around. The seahorses are derived from pipefish. Pipe in seahorses, the males have a skin flap on their bellies into which the females deposit their eggs, causing the male to become, so to speak, pregnant. As a result, females in some seahorse species can produce eggs faster than the males can give birth to the eggs that they are incubating. Hence, the females can mate with more males than males can mate with females, so that the males become choosy and the females promiscuous. The proper sex roles are reversed. Now, sex role reversed species such as the seahorse ipso facto demonstrate that no connection necessarily exists between gamete size and sex role. The promiscuous versus choosy dichotomy can apply to either sex regardless of the fact that by definition, males always make the smaller gamete and females the larger gamete. What do males bring? The anglerfish is about the size of a golf ball and, and named because of the bait-like tassel at the end of a front-facing dorsal spine. The anglerfish is a fisherwoman. A large fish, the large fish depicted is a female. The small bumps on its bottom are males, sometimes called dwarf males or parasitic males. They are physically attached to the female and in some species are even connected with the female's blood circulatory system. Two males are attached to this female, a mating arrangement called polyandry. Do males provide no parental care, content to contribute their good genes to their offspring with the work of raising the young defaulting to the female? Well, dwarf males illustrate the ultimate male who brings only his sperm to the mating. If all males, like anglerfish males, were no more than heat sinking ballistic testes, then they too would be dwarf males. The fact that males are generally whole organisms themselves rather than convenient accessories carried by the females implies that males in fact do bring more than solely their genes. Now, what is the proper genital anatomy? The top shows females from two species of South American spider monkeys. Notice the structures resembling a penis. I don't know if you can see my cursor here. The pendulous clitoris. But notice the structures resembling a penis. These are calling, called a pendulous clitoris. They are used in signaling. The pendulous clitoris of females is about the same size as the penis of males. Now the bottom panel shows the tip of a penis log lodged in the genital canal of a male whale. Male whales and porpoises do not possess a, a penis and scrotum dangling outside the body. Instead, material that in terrestrial mammals contributes to the scrotum, apparently does not fuse, leaving a groove lined by labia that protects the penis and leads to a hydrodynamically streamlined body. The testes remain within the body cavity. An enlarged clitoris. 
unfused scrotal sac, and undescended testes all set off bells and whistles when seen on a human baby in a hospital delivery room, prompting calls for surgical intervention to, quote, correct the unusual genital morphology. Because almost all imaginable shapes of genitals are found among mammals, other vertebrates, and even invertebrates, nothing is inherently pathological about an unusual shape of genitals. In humans, an unusual genital morphology may be accompanied with pathological side effects, such as poor kidney function. Now, where does the actual pathology lie? It is a defective kidney function, not the unusually shaped genitals. Defective kidney function is not punishment, so to speak, for unusually shaped genitals. Now, do transgender animals exist? I define gender to mean the morphology, behavior, and life history of a sexed body. A sexed body is a body classified with respect to the size of the gametes produced. Gender is morphology plus action. How an organism uses its morphology, including color and shape plus behavior, to carry out a reproductive role through life. For species in which most males have certain traits and most females have other traits, a significant percentage of males may also be found to have female traits and females to have male traits. This allows for what has been termed transgender animals. The best studied example occurs in sun angel hummingbird species from the Andes. Male sun angel hummingbirds have colorful feathers on their throats called a gorget, as illustrated in the slide. A female with a gorget is referred to here as a masculine female. She has also a comparatively shorter bill than the male. Conversely, feminine males also exist with a special female trait such as a longer bill. Among 42 species of hummingbirds surveyed throughout the Andes, 18 species had a significant percentage of masculine females, feminine males, or both. 24 species had neither masculine females nor feminine males. Now, males use their gorgets in territorial defense of common short flowers that fit their shorter bills. Masculine females, like the males, can also defend territories of short flowers. Conversely, feminine males have longer bills than the masculine males. Feminine males use different flowers from the masculine males, namely relatively rare long tubular flowers that do not need to be defended in a territory. So masculine females occupy slightly different niches from feminine females. And conversely, feminine males also occupy somewhat different niches from masculine males. Gender expression in birds reflects a gender difference in occupation. And transgender birds are those whose occupation crosses over into the occupation typical of the other gender. Now, how many genders are there? The slide shows ruffs, a European shorebird species with three male genders and one female gender. The left panel shows the male gender with a dark ruff. The middle panel shows the male gender with a white ruff. And the top right panel shows the male gender with no ruff. The bottom middle panel shows the female also with no ruff. Ruffs mate in leks, places where males congregate to attract females. The black ruff male defends, the black ruff males defend small so-called courts within the legs and within each displays to visiting females. The white rough males do not defend courts within the leg 
and instead keep company with the females as they feed away from the leg. When a white ruffed male is nearby and a black ruffed male is alone on a court, the black ruffed male dances to invite the white ruffed male to join him on his court. Females who then arrive at the lek prefer to mate with a black-white team of males rather than with only a black ruffed male. Ruffs illustrate gender multiplicity in animal. Two sexes do not imply only two genders. The lower right illustrates a black ruffed male mating with a ruffless male, a mating that is homosexual yet heterogeneral. The next slide will illustrate a mating that is a mating that is both homosexual and homogeneral. So do homosexual animals exist? By homosexuality, I refer to same-sex mounting, regardless of context, and to the mutual touching of genitals. Today, after a long struggle, the reality of extensive homosexuality among animals is generally accepted among biologists. Photographs on the web illustrate many species showing, showing same-sex matings in nature, including numerous charismatic vertebrates. This slide, which I took in 2018 during a safari to South Africa, illustrates two male elephants mating. The mating is both homosexual and homogeneral. And you can see that they're both males by the penises they exhibit. The 300 or so well-documented examples of homosexuality in animals, surely an underestimate, reveal much diversity. In some species, only males are homosexual. In some, only females. In others, both sexes. In almost all species, the homosexuality is mixed in with heterosexuality by the same individual. In some species, a small fraction participates in homosexuality in others, like the bonobo chimpanzee, every animal participates in homosexuality. Homosexuality is widely distributed across many higher taxa, implying that homosexuality has originated many times in the animal kingdom. People wonder why the male elephant in the slide is wasting time mating with one another rather than with courting females instead. Presumably, the answer is that they are not wasting time, that in their present circumstances, the benefits of males building bonds with one another through homosexual mating outweighs the benefits of pursuing a heterosexual courtship. Rather than wondering why an animal is homosexual, the converse may be more interesting. Why isn't every animal homosexual, perhaps mixed in with some minimal amount of heterosexuality to ensure reproduction? I turn now to gender expression in humans. The comparative anthropology of gender expression is poorly documented, although the 1994 classic by Gilbert Hurt, Third Sex, Third Gender, Beyond Sexual Dimorphism in Culture and Nature, in Culture and History, remains timely. Transgender expressions are vastly more common in the West than we have been led to believe. About 15 years ago, medical sources were still floating figures that only 0.01% people were transgender, were transsexual. The latest figures in 2016 from the Williams Institute at UCLA show that 0.6% are transgender in the United States, about 60 times more common than previous estimates. As we look beyond the contemporary West, we encounter a huge variety of cultural forms and institutions inhabited by transgender and third gender people. The following slides will illustrate four examples. Example one, two spirits from North America. Many Indian nations and tribes in the Americas have two-spirit people, a name that suggests people who possess a combination of feminine and masculine nature. Collectively, these people include male-bodied individuals living as women 
and female-bodied individuals living as men. On the left is a 1900 photograph of Oshchish, a male-bodied two-spirit person from the Crow Nation in the present-day Wyoming Dakotas who lived as a woman. On the right is an 1890s photograph of a female-bodied two-person, two-spirit person from the Ketch <clears throat> excuse me, from the Quechuan area of Northwestern South America who lived as a man and specifically as a warrior. This warrior dressed in male clothing presents a confident, almost jaunty manner with no attempt to cover or bind the breasts. The middle is a painting of another female bodied warrior from the plains, from the plains Indians between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Notice the bare breasts. Two spirited people assume cross gender occupations. They do not try to hide or modify their anatomy because in these cultures, occupation rather than genital morphology are the markers of gender identity. Transgender and gay people are often accused of recruiting young boys into their way of life. <clears throat> Invariably, the truth is that young people themselves seek out older transgender and gay people whom they see as kindred spirits. The anthropologist Walter Williams, in his 1986 book, describes the ceremony by which young boys from several Indian tribes announce their gender and are welcomed by the tribe. Among the Mojave tribes along the Colorado River in the American Southwest, Williams writes about how parents deal with a boy who has a pre predisposition to be two-spirited. When the child is about 10 years old, his relatives begin discussing his predispositions. The relatives then prepare a ceremony without letting the boy know about it. The ceremony is meant to take him by surprise and to serve as both an initiation and a test of his true inclinations. People from various settlements attend. The family wants the community to see it. The boy is led into the circle. If he remains there, he accepts that he will go through with the ceremony. A singer sings songs. If the songs move him, he will dance as women do and dance with intensity. If the boy dances as a woman for four songs, his status as a two-spirit is confirmed. Then he is taken by the women, bathed, receives a skirt, returns to the crowd, and announces her new feminine name. Among the Tohono O'Gram Indians of the Sonoran Desert of the American Southwest, the ceremony also involves a public test of, in, of inclination. At a social gathering of family and friends, a small brush enclosure is built. A man's bow and arrows and a woman's basket are placed inside. The boy is then brought to the enclosure. As the adults watch, he is told to enter the enclosure. The adults set fire to the enclosure. The boy has time to take only one of two items. If he takes the basket while leaving the bow and arrow, he is confirmed as a two-spirit. As Williams notes, in all these practices, the role of the two-spirit is not forced on the boy by others. While adults may have their suspicion about the boy's inclinations, it is only when the boy makes the proper move that he is considered two-spirited. By doing woman's dancing, preparing a meal, or taking the woman's basket, a boy is making an important symbolic gesture. Native Americans do not see the assumption of a two-spirit status as a free will choice by the boy. People feel the boy is acting out and revealing their basic character. The slide illustrates yet another dance involving a two-spirit person this from the Sac and Fox Nation of Indians from the American Southern Midwest. Now example two, 
eunuchs in ancient cultures. The people referred to in the Bible as eunuchs formed the counterpart to the transgender people of today. The top left shows an icon of a gender variant Christian that I photographed at an old church during a visit to Ethiopia in 2009. On the right is another icon of a gender variant Christian that I photographed on a cave wall in Cappadocia, Turkey in 2008. The lower left shows a reproduction of the Cappadocian cave wall painting that serves as decoration in a shop selling souvenir items to tourists near the entrance to the complex of caves. Local people in Cappadocia are well aware of the icon depicting the gender variant Christian, although no one seems to know the parable or other story to which the icon refers. The Hebrew Testament in the Bible contains explicit reference to units, to eunuchs in a progression from rejection to acceptance and welcome. A passage in Deuteronomy rejects eunuchs. No man whose testicles are crushed or whose penis is cut off can be Lord, can belong to the Lord's assembly. This sentiment is then reversed by the prophet Isaiah. And don't let the eunuch say, I am a dry tree. The Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, choose what I desire and remain loyal to my covenant. In my temple and courts, I give them a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give to them an enduring name that won't be removed. My house will be known as a house of prayer for all peoples, says the Lord God, who gathers Israel's outcasts. I will gather still others to those I have already gathered. The historian Matthew Keffler in his 2001 book, detailed the various occupations of eunuchs in the Roman Empire. Many eunuchs were slaves, bought and sold in the slave market. Their roles ran the gamut from serving as domestic servants all the way to serving in the royal administrations of Greek kingdoms of the Eastern Mediterranean. Kepler quotes original sources that disparagingly describe eunuchs who, quote, feminized their faces, rubbed, rubbed smoothed their skin, and disgraced their manly sex by donning women's regalia. They nurse their tresses and pretty them up woman fashion. They dress in soft garments and can hardly hold their heads erect on their languid necks. Next, being thus divorced from masculinity, they get intoxicated with the music of flutes. Sources state that such eunuchs renounced their previous ma masculine identities and called one another girls in private. Some eunuchs were evidently marrying as women, prompting a ruling to outlaw this practice. In 342, the Christian emperors Constantine II and Constans imposed the death penalty, quote, when a man married in the, ma in the manner of a woman and as a woman wants to offer herself to men. However, the appearance of eunuchs varied considerably, depending in part on the age at which their testicles were removed. Some eunuchs tended to look more andro androgynously boyish rather than exaggeratedly feminine. One of the most conspicuous occupations for free eunuchs was as priestesses to a goddess called the mother of gods, Cybele. The Sibelian priestesses were a stable and long-lasting transgender group. In 1999, archaeologists showed that a male-bodied person from Yorkshire, England, was buried in female clothes and jewelry. Was that this person was the remains of a fourth century Sibelian priestess. The religion was well established in the north of England. Hadrian's Wall at Corbridge contains an altar dedicated to Sibiel. The top left shows a reconstruction of the town where the, of the Yorkshire town where the Sibelian altar was found. The bottom left shows feminine bracelets worn by the male bodied person found there. And the right shows an artist's depiction of the apparel worn by the priestess. The Sibelian priestess 
had religious rights The Sibelian priestesses had religious rights for performing a kind of sex reassignment surgery. These took place each year in the spring of March 24, on March 24th. Candidate priestesses served their genitals, sorry there. Sibelian priestesses had religious rights for performing a kind of sex reassignment surgery. These took place each year in the spring on March 24th. Candidate priestesses severed their genitals with a sickle in an ecstatic frenzy. After the operation, a Sibelian priestess adopts women's clothing, revealing, including wearing a veil and jewelry and growing long hair. Particularly interesting is that a priestess places the severed genitals on the doorstep of a house and the women of that house give her some of their clothing to start a wardrobe. The action of the priestesses was portrayed as a religious sacrifice of individual fertility to enhance the fertility of the community. Yet the eagerness of the Sibelian priestesses for the operation suggests the mythology behind the Sibel priestess castration amounts to religious cover for achieving a gender transition. One would expect hostility from the early Christians to the Sibelian priestesses. After all, Sibel worship was a rival religion to Christianity. Indeed, the early Christian writer Lactantius described the public liturgies as insanity and used today's transphobic language to decry the mutilation into neither men nor women. Augustine, revealed the amputation of virility in which the sufferer was changed, was neither changed into a woman nor allowed to remain a man. Yet the Christian testament of the Bible takes a different approach. At the bottom of the slide, Jesus is quoted as saying, for there are eunuchs who have been eunuchs from birth and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by other people. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs because of the kingdom of heaven. Those who can accept it should accept it. Furthermore, in Acts 8, the evangelist Philip puts Jesus' teaching into practice. Philip baptizes a eunuch into the Christian church. The Bible passage from Acts appears in the slide. Philip's ha Philip has gone to the city of Samaria to preach. Then an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. At noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Candace. Candace is a title given to the Ethiopian queen. He was reading the prophet Isaiah sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach this carriage and stay with it. The eunuch invited Philip to come up and sit with him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from being baptized? Philip said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you can be. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. He ordered the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip baptized him. Now this baptism welcomes not only a eunuch to the church, but a black skinned foreigner as well. A foreigner who is possibly also a slave. Now reflect on this moment. Uh, reflect a moment on this event. How would Philip know that the person that the person in the char chariot was a eunuch? The person had to be somehow conspicuously different from ordinary men, though recognizably male. 
the person would also have to be recognizably female to some extent. Otherwise, Philip would not know the person to be a eunuch. Reflect too on the condition Philip stipulated for membership in the church. One solely must believe in Jesus as God's son. Notice the absence of additional requirements. No need to dress and present as a man. No need to avoid sexual relations with men or women. No need for special bathrooms. Just believe in Jesus as the son of God, and that's it. And no limit on participation. No stipulation that the eunuch must remain only a worship and not become a disciple. No stipulation that the eunuch could not baptize other and welcome them into the church. Or to use today's language, no limit on serving in church leadership in ecclesiastical or lay capacities, in addition to participating in ordinary worship. Collectively, the passages in Isaiah, Matthew, and Acts comprise an, affir an affirmation of diversity in gender expression, race, and class. <clears throat> These passages are not ambiguous one-liners inviting misappropriation. Instead, the passages are clear, direct, and extensive. Nor in the Bible's writings are eunuchs ever attended by any hint of moral approbation. Thus, both the Hebrew and Christian testaments of the Bible instruct full inclusion of gender diverse people in all roles within Judeo Christian communities of worship. Example three, contemporary hijra in India. In 2006, I was invited to give a plenary talk to a conference in New Delhi sponsored by UN AIDS and organized by Shiva Nandra Khan of the Naz Foundation. I agreed to come if I could meet and interview some members from a large group of over 1 million transgender people known as hijra. The hijra comprised both a caste and a religious sect. The word hijra was translated by colonial British as eunuch, reflecting the hijra use of an indigenous sex reassignment surgery called the nirvan. Hijra religion, especially in North India, focuses on devotion to the mother goddess Mata. The religion is principally Hindu with some elements of Islam. After the conference, I was taken to shanty towns, including one shown on the slide, which is of a shanty town under a highway bridge. A typical occupation of Hijra is to perform celebrations at the birth of a male child and at weddings to offer the blessings of Mata. The Hijra sing and dance as a small band with drums, tambourines, and flutes, as the audio clip demonstrates. <laughs> With the westernization of India, the, de the demand for these ceremonies is declining, and hijra work increasingly work in the sex trade or in begging. The slide shows a group of hijra sex workers that I met. The anthropologist Serena Nanda, in her 1999 book, described the social organization of the hijra. They are organized nationally into seven named houses, Elders from each house meet collectively to formally approve the admission of a candidate to the hedra. A candidate hedra is called a chila and is apprenticed to a guru. The slide shows a guru in her white sari with a chila on her left side. I am sitting to her right side. The chila gives the guru her earnings and submits to her authority. The guru is responsible for the welfare of her chila. A guru usually lives with her chilas in a small commune, typically five or so. Occasionally, a hijra marries and lives with her husband. The guru's husband is sitting next to me on my right. Example four, contemporary transgender people of Polynesia. Transgender people occur throughout Oceania. On the left is a transgender woman from Guam who is attending the conference. 
in India. On the right are transgender people from Hawaii called Mahu that I met on a different occasion, also in 2006. Mahu occur throughout Polynesia and are especially prominent in Tahiti. The event I attended with Mahu took place in Hilo, a town on the big island of Hawaii. The event included a show with Hawaiian and Western music. Shows with transgender people in the US mainland typically comprise beauty contests, cotillions, or drag talent for a primarily gay male audience. In contrast, the show in Hawaii was a mostly clean fun, quote, girls night out for straight women, many of whom were married with families. I wish to discuss, to pass now to discuss two technical issues. One, is transgender a pathology? I've presented the preceding sample of transgender people throughout the world to establish that trans people comprise a significant for, portion of the human species now and in the past. The Western perspective on transgender people relies on a medical construction that presumes a heterosexual gender, bi gender binary as standard and views variation from that binary as a pathology. Then space is made for the variant people by appealing to the moral principle of human rights. Quote, even the disabled have rights. The medical construction is a mistake and reveals an ignorance of elementary population genetics. For a genetic trait to be considered as a pathology, it must be deleterious under all circumstances. In population genetics, a connection is known between how rare a pathological trait is and how, how deleterious it is. The more deleterious the trait is, the rarer it is. For example, almost lethal traits like Huntington's disease are present at five, at five per 100,000 births. Hemophilia A at one birth per 8,500 and so forth, very rare. Now, gay and transgender people are nowhere close to being this rare. According to the most recent 2016 demographic information from the Williams Institute at UCLA, in the US, 3.5% of adults identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and an estimated 0.6% of adults identif identify as transgender. The slide holds the answer. The degree of rarity for, for pathology is set by a balance between two rates, the rate at which the pathology arises by mutation and the rate at which it is eliminated by natural selection. This balance point is called a mutation selection equilibrium. The slide presents a table showing the balance point between rarity and deleteriousness, assuming a standard mutation rate of healthy to pathology of one in a million. Rarity is measured in terms of births. Deleteriousness is measured in terms of percentage loss of survival and or fecundity caused by the pathology, the so-called Darwinian fitness in population genetic jargon. If a pathology is lethal, like at the bottom of the table, then a trait is exceedingly rare, one in a million, representing a fresh mutation in each instance. For pathologies that are only slightly deleterious, the pathology becomes much more common as indicated in the lines toward the top of the table. So compare the rarity of gay and transgender people with what the table says their deleterious would be if, if gay and transgender were a pathology. For gays, the rarity lies between the top two lines of the table. For trans, the rarity lies between the second and third lines of the table. For both, the deleteriousness is effectively non-existent. Instead, the gay straight and cis trans dichotomies represent polymorphisms in the human species population. The gay straight and cis trans polymorphism frequencies have been more or less stable through many generations. And these polymorphisms probably represent what population geneticists call 
protected polymorphisms. That is, a gay strategy can increase when rare in a population mostly of straights, and a straight strategy can increase when rare in a population mostly of gays, leading to a polymorphism at some intermediate frequency. Similarly, a trans strategy can increase when rare, and a cis strategy can too, leading to a cis trans stable polymorphism. Therefore, the medical construction of how to view people who differ from the heterosexual gender binary as a pathology is invalid. Instead, a future project should seek to uncover the benefits to the human variation in gender and sexuality. The second technical point I wish to raise is what is gender identity? The genitals and the brain develop at different times, separated by months. The genitals may develop in one hormonal regime and the brain in another, producing a developmental pathway for the ontogeny of the transgender phenotype. Many studies are now reporting that the physical brain structure of transgender people more closely resembles the gender they identify with rather than their genital sex. Still, the brain structure studies do not answer this basic question. What exactly is gender identity? I envision gender identity as a cognitive lens. When a baby opens his or her eyes after birth and looks around, whom will the baby emulate and whom will she, he or she merely notice? I hypothesize that a lens exists in the brain that controls who to focus, focus on as a tutor. Transgender identity then is the acceptance of a tutor from a different genital sex. Gender expression then depends both on brain state which is where the lens is, and on early postnatal experience because the environment supplies the image photographed through the lens. This hypothesis may be tested experimentally. In duetting birds, male chicks learn their song from male tuner, tutors and female chicks from female tutors, likely their fathers and mothers. How does a male chick know to listen to his father instead of his mother? I wonder if an occasional male chick learns his mother's song and an occasional female chick learns his father's song. Such gender crossing birds would offer a model system to study transgender behavior and brain structure experimentally. The slide shows the duetting calls of a canebrake wren from the Caribbean side of Central America, including Costa Rica. A song is initiated by the adult male, shown in green, and an adult female replies, shown in turquoise, followed by a male's response in light green. The, male, the female male couplet continues until the duet ends. The sonogram on top also shows a juvenile female in purple that has not, let, not yet learned the proper cadence, producing a jumble of sounds. Notice the purple and turquoise traces do not overlap in this sonogram. Compare with the lower sonogram that shows the juveniles after a few weeks. The purple and turquoise traces now overlap, showing that the juvenile song has come to coincide with her mother's. A clear duet results between the two females and the males. The juvenile learns not only what to sing, but also when to sing. So the first song here should be uh, where the female, where the juvenile hasn't learned yet. Okay, so you see it's kind of jumbled. Now he, the next sonogram is where the, the, um, the, the, the juvenile has learned. So do you hear there how, I'll play them again. The first one that you can hear that 
that there's not a clear staccato to it, that the sounds of the two birds are jumbled with one another. Whereas in the second one, in the second sonogram, there's a clear staccato that's, that you can discern. The neurobiology of song learning is well known in birds like canaries and zebra finches where only the male sings. The techniques from those studies can be transferred to duetting species to reveal the neurobiology of how both cisgender and transgender expression develops. Okay, the overarching theme to the preceding slides from zoology and anthropology is that the sex gender binary is a quaint myth of historical interest. Perhaps not so quaint though, because belief in the binary leads to medical mistakes, harmful social policy and religious abuse. In biology, nature abhors a category. The sex and gender binaries are categories. Natural variation among organisms inexorably spills over and under the definitional walls of any category, dissolving the walls themselves. Our challenge is to understand the adaptive pressures that cause organisms to flow beyond any definitional constraints. Our challenge is to resist the temptation to shore up those constraints by condemning the escaped variation as genetic error, pathology, or sin. Instead, variation in gender and sexuality is an adaptive expression of life itself, and it is good. Thank you.